Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble. I'm excited to be here today with Fabiana Claré from the Musician's Profit Umbrella. And we are going to talk about all things musicians and entrepreneurship, which, of course, as you know, is one of my favorite topics, um, ways that musicians can make money, transition out of that starving artist mentality that a lot of us started out in. And uh, so we're going to cover all those topics in a minute, but I want to get started by just finding out a bit about Fabiana's story and how she started out uh, working in music and then how she kind of transitioned to being online and um, really encouraging musicians to be entrepreneurs. Thank you, Bree. I am delighted to be in your show today. Thank you for having me. What a great opportunity to connect with your community. You've been doing such amazing work. First of all, I just want to congratulate you for really creating such a wonderful path, building you know, content and opportunities for musicians to, as you said, get out of that starving artist mentality and learn what are the viable ways for creating thriving careers in the arts. So congratulations, first of all, on your work. And I'm excited to connect and have this conversation with you today. A little bit more about my journey. Uh, I was pianist for my entire life. All of my degrees were in piano performance. Uh, I have an international background. So my parents are from Bolivia and I grew up in different parts of the world, in the US and Bolivia and in Cuba. And 20 years ago, actually, my husband and I came from Cuba to Charleston and we started our, our higher education here in the US and pursued our bachelor's, our master's, our artist certificate, our doctor degrees in different parts of the country. And it was all about performing. We you know, played internationally, we won competitions. I sold it with orchestras and had a really wonderful experience of just developing a career, developing a career as a musician and kind of proving myself uh, that it is possible to to be a successful musician and to not have to have, let's say, you know, a secondary career that would be the backup plan. I, I went all in, uh, much to the dis- dismay of my parents, especially my dad, who was a civil engineer with a master's in economics. And he was just like, what, you're going to be a pianist? Like, what in the world? No one was a musician in my family. And so I Um, you know, I just decided to go all in. And I remember telling my dad when I was a teenager, dad, I love music. Like, I know I'm going to be successful because I love it. And if I love it, it's going to work out. Trust me, don't worry. (laughs) And so it did. But I have to say, for most of my career leading up to my doctor degree, I didn't think about anything else than music. I didn't think about business. I didn't think about how I was going to make a living. I just focused on becoming the best pianist I could be. Uh, And then obviously as as you know, I started really adulting, so to speak, and started to figuring out now, how am I going to make a living? Uh, I started to realize that there were some significant gaps in my education, that everything I had strived for was missing a very important element, which was how, are I, how am I going to make money when I, when I finish all of this fun trajectory of just, you know, studying and performing and getting ready for the next concert and this and that, you know, fortunately, all of my education was sponsored by full scholarship. So money wasn't ever really an issue going through college. And that was a blessing and also a curse, right? Because I didn't really want to worry about it until the very end. So Mm -hmm. when I was finishing my doctorate degree, I started to wonder now what, you know, and initially, I was very much under the mentality that I was going to follow what I knew what was familiar, which was to graduate with a doctorate and then pursue a university education, a university tenure track position and get a faculty job right somewhere. Um, And 
I started to look at how that process went and how competitive it was and how difficult it was to, to really get a, a university position right out of college. And it became actually a really an, almost an obsession of mine to investigate. And I actually wrote my dissertation around this topic, around what are the ways that pianists are able to make, you know, thriving careers uh, that allow them to stay active as musicians while still making a living. And I really started to get serious about investigating and looking at the data and the statistics, much to the uh, shock of my committee who were like, wow, these are really grim statistics that you're bringing up. Do you really have to publish this? They even asked me, do you really have to publish this in your dissertation? And I was like, well, yeah, because I'm just learning about this now. I wish I would have known this much sooner. So absolutely, I want people to know these statistics. And so that was the first wake up call. And I started looking at the music business program that the university had. And I decided to start taking some courses and start learning about music business and the entrepreneurship. And uh, I started to realize that I had indeed been already an entrepreneur without knowing it. I had Mm -hmm. already been doing lots of things. I just didn't understand what those concepts looked like. And I started to become fascinated with the similarities between music and business and how the the traits that we develop as musicians can be easily transferable to the business world and can actually help us set ourselves apart. So that became, you know, a really interesting part of my culminating, the culminating part of my education. And pretty quickly, um, I started to think about, you know, how can I make my own money? How can I create my livelihood without needing someone to hire me? Uh, And my husband and I attended a a conference at the MTNA National uh, Association's, uh, you know, their their national meeting back in 2010. This was 12 years ago. And as we returned from that, we, you know, we had this idea of building our own music school. Uh, And it was right around the time we were about to finish. And we just said, you know, this would be awesome. Let's create a music school that really addresses a problem that we identified around the gaps that most entering music majors have when they start uh, college uh, and it just it just became a pro, a process of learning how to put a business plan together, how to actually create every step of the way, uh, starting to pitch it, presenting it in different venues, getting you know support uh, and getting mentorship from business coaches, from uh, advisors, from uh, you know venture capitalists, and started to position ourselves everywhere we could. We even entered a music business, a business plan competition in the School of Business, where everyone else was an MBA candidate, and we were the only pianists there. Everyone was scratching their heads, like, what in the world are you both doing here? You're, you guys are pra- like pianists. You should be in the practice room. Um, and we actually won second prize, best written business plan award, and best entrepreneurial spirit award in that competition, and, and raised almost ten thousand dollars, and were able to launch our first business, our music academy. Uh, and it's been now twelve years since we started that school, and for the last six years, we've actually been running it remotely across the country. We moved to Texas when I was appointed director for the music business and entrepreneurship program at UNT where they needed someone to come in and help musicians build their careers. And so we actually had to re, like restructure our school so we would continue running without us there. Uh, and so for the past six years now, we've been running it here from, uh, from Texas, mainly my husband. And it's just been a great journey of learning not just how to create businesses, but also how to delegate them and let them kind of run as well without needing every aspect of our involvement in it. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, uh, as I was running the, pro- the program at UNT and really, you know, helping musicians in that capacity as a university educator, uh, I started realizing that there was a need for even more support, uh, that all of this content uh, could be absorbed and, and valued beyond the university realm uh, exclusively. And so I started really learning how to position myself in the online space I had been very active in in conferences prior to that and doing a lot of speaking engagements and things, but not in the online space. So it was a great opportunity to learn how to position myself, build an online brand, package all of the things that I could offer into a unified sense of identity, so to speak, and build a coaching program. And it's now been two years that I've been now doing this in the online space uh, and helping musicians all around the world. And I reached a point last year where I actually had to make a decision because the business was really taking me into a direction that was very difficult to keep up with my full-time job at the university. Uh, And I really had to make a decision if I wanted to go all in in my business and really let it grow and allow it to to get to the level that I know it can be, I had to quit my full-time job. So I quit my full-time job last year. uh, And that was 
a big, big decision, probably one of the biggest decisions that I've made in my life, to be honest. Um, and, you know, it's a big, big risk, but I'm very grateful that I gave myself that chance to go all in. Uh, and that's kind of now been a new thing that I'm like trying to inspire musicians to to not feel that they need to hold on to things when they no longer serve them, but to be able to learn how to build their careers in a way that allows them to release whatever they need to release whenever they want. Mm, wow. I love that. And it's interesting because your background was pretty much all in universities until you moved online. And, you know, I have a completely different background and that I was doing everything online from the beginning. Uh, although my husband's a university professor, so <laughs> okay. not in music, but like, you know, we're experiencing that too. It's like the idea of letting go of that security and like, maybe he wants to go do something else because he's been in that world for 22 years or whatever. So that's a, that's a hard thing to give that up. It's Im I'm impressed that you, you did that. Obviously you built something first. You didn't just go like, I'm just gonna, you know, burn everything to the ground and like go out and start building some, I mean, something from scratch and hope it works. So I'm curious, like where, where do you feel like people need to be in order to make that kind of a big leap? Like maybe they're in a corporate job or maybe they're, you know, in a university or they're working for another music school or something. And, you know, what do you think they need to do on their, their end as an entrepreneur to be, to, to really prove to themselves that like, okay, this is a thing I can, I can do this and I, it's time to take the leap. Oh, that's such a great question, Brie, because I wish I had the answer. <laughs> I wish I had the specific answer to tell you, like, this is the exact moment. If there's one thing I have learned from this experience and from taking that leap of faith is that you need to do it when you feel you need to do it. Mm. When you are in the process of when you start feeling that you something needs to change, it's a great moment to start creating things. But in reality, you're never going to feel 100% safe doing mm. it. You're never going to have a guarantee. You're never going to have that actionable plan that is like, this is going to work. So now I'm going to take the leap of faith. There needs to be an element of just betting on yourself and saying, you know what? I've reached a point right now where I want to give myself a chance to do it. And I'm going to let go of what no longer saves, you know, serves me. Uh, and then you will actually start seeing how much you can advance and how much you can grow. And you're going to be surprised at things that can happen when you are willing to let go. It, there are many reasons why holding on to things longer than you should. I'm not saying quit at the very beginning, but I'm just saying work your way into feeling that sense of, uh, you know, relative confidence, I want to say, because it's never 100% confidence, but that relative confidence that what you're building can be successful. And when you feel that you want to just go all in, that's the best time to do it. Because in reality, the longer you hold on to things that are going to take away your energy, that are going to take away your focus, the harder it's going to be for you to really build what you want to build. And that um, jumping off cliff attitude is also going to force you to really give it your all when you're building your own business. Uh, and you're not going to have that foot towards the back that you're stepping back saying, well, if it doesn't work, I could always go back to this. In fact, it's so interesting. I was just listening to Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, uh, which is such a great legendary classic, right? And that's actually something they were talking about. That was one of the key characteristics that all of the people they researched did. They literally, they refer to it as they burned the bridges behind them. So they had mm -hmm. no way out. And that's what allowed all of those successful millionaires and billionaires to really get that type of, um, you know, prosperity and wealth in their lives is that they were all in. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is that you can't really tell how stressed you are or, or how much uh, you are just putting up with things until you change. I tell you this because I felt that myself. I wasn't at a point of breakthrough necessarily, even though many of my colleagues, when they heard the news and they learned that I had stepped out of, you know, a tenure position, tenure track position. And it was like, what in the world? What happened? Like, we need to know what was the problem. There wasn't anything that specifically happened. I just got to a point where I kind of outgrew it. And I was just felt like I need more. I know I can 
get more. I had already exceeded, you know, more than doubled my entire year long salary in academia with my, you know, business. And I knew that the potential for me to grow was there, but nothing really happened. So to speak, there wasn't like a big problem, but yet as I was keeping my university job and, you know, working on my online business, coaching business, I started to feel very overwhelmed and burned out. And I'm also a mother of two. I have a two-year-old, a seven-year-old. Uh, and, you know, it, it just started to feel like it was a lot. But the, the moment I realized how much pressure I was under was after I quit Brie. Mm. After I sent the letter, after I submitted my resignation, after I just released it lovingly, right? The next day, the next few days, oh my gosh, I felt this amazing sense of relief, right? This sense of wonder of like, oh my gosh, now I've got all this time that I can actually do it exactly the way I want it. This is amazing. Yay! I started to feel this liberation that I didn't realize I, I needed until after I took the leap of faith. So this is kind of my word of advice to all of our listeners is like, even if you feel you're okay, even if you feel you're hanging in there, even if you feel it's not that bad, you won't really know how great it can be until you give yourself a chance. Mm. Mm. Wow. That's great. And it, it is true. And having that mental white space to be able to like, suddenly so many more ideas can come to you because you're not already like your mind isn't having to work on all the problems that are at that other job that you're working on. Right. Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I don't think people need to rush into things. They just need to follow their instinct. There isn't a specific timeline that everyone needs to follow. I think there are many advantages of keeping your job as you are starting a business because it gives you an opportunity to have a set relative stability in terms of income, in terms of cash flow. It can even give you an opportunity to uh, reinvest some of your income into more support for yourself, into hiring a, an assistant, into having more support around building all of the different things you need as a business owner versus having to be doing it all yourself. So I think there's great advantages of creating a business with some sort of a additional income coming in, right? At the beginning, mm -hmm. and I've met many successful entrepreneurs who started their businesses while still having a job. And they went on for one, two, even more years until they got to that breakthrough moment where they just said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to jump. I'm going to do it. I'm ready to go all in, right? So I think it's Everyone needs to tune into their own intuition a little bit and, and just know that there won't ever be a hundred percent certainty that you're going to be ready. It's kind of like having kids. <laughs> you're never quite yes. sure you're ready to be a parent and you're just like, I'm just going to give it a try and see what happens. Right. It's the same feeling. So it's, it's a very intuitive process, but I think it's a beautiful one because if you give yourself the chance and you are willing to, um, give yourself that opportunity to succeed. You may also fail, but it's just a matter of saying yes to yourself instead of, you know, thinking that you're not going to do it because it could fail. You're taking a decision. I always like talking about, you know, as human beings, we make decisions based out of love or fear, period. It's either one of those two emotions. And I believe being willing to go all in into our businesses, even though we know it could fail, you know, we're still giving ourselves that, opportunity to succeed. And we're loving ourselves in that process versus not doing it because we're afraid we're going to fail. That's definitely a decision made out of fear. Mm -hmm. So that's also a great way to, to make that decision. It's like when you feel the need, just tune into it. Like, are you more afraid or are you more loving? And mm -hmm. if you're leaning towards, no, I want to, I really want to do this and I'm still terrified, but, but I really want to do this, then, then do it, you know, because the fear is never going to go away. It's part of this process. In fact, one of my, my students would ask me when I was teaching at the university, Dr. Clara, how did you um, know that your business was like set? At what point did you feel that your business was like, like successful and you had achieved your goal and everything was safe and everything was, and I told them, like, I would never, them, I'll let you know when I feel that way. Right. It hasn't happened yet. I'll be the first to let you know whenever I get to that point. But in reality, I don't think I've ever felt that way about my business and I don't know when I'm going to feel that way. Right. So it's kind of like adopting that mentality of being okay with risk and just knowing it's part of it and still being, I mean, we all know that one of, 
you know, risk taking is one of the core characteristics of successful entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. their ability to take calculated risks. I like to say it, not irresponsible risks, but risks nonetheless. Right. Yep. For sure. For sure. So, you know, a lot of the musicians that I work with, um, at least over the past several years, I've been trying to encourage them to understand that as a solo musician or in a band or whatever, they are already acting as an entrepreneur because they are running a business, whether they realize it or not. Right. And then recently I've started working with some people who are already musicians and then they want to, you know, start a, a teaching or a coaching program. Are you working mostly with people who are doing teaching and coaching kinds of programs, or are you also working with musicians who are building a business and a fan base? Well, I like to see it as both because mm -hmm. in order for you to build any sort of online business, you need a fan base, you need a community, you need to build awareness of your brand. So what I like helping musicians do is to unite all of their interests uh, if they are performing, if they are teaching, if they have any sort of administrative or other related non-musical exp expertise, uh, I like helping them kind of see how they can package it all into one united brand mm -hmm. uh, and then build their fan base, build their community so that whatever they decide to do, whether it's sell an album or or have some sort of a teaching offer or or a way for people to work with them, maybe as a coach or as a consultant, Whatever they decide to put together, they're doing it on top of a strong brand foundation, right? Uh, and by putting all of the things together, it actually makes it easier for people to kind of get what they're about and set themselves apart. I like that because we do get a lot of people coming to us and they're like, I've been a musician, you know, I've been building my like performing brand or recording brand for all these years. And now I want to teach. And they're always like, should I start a new social media? You know, should I start, should I have a totally different brand name for my teaching? And I always say no, mostly for on, on my side, because I know that if they've got multiple accounts and multiple, like they're not going to be able to keep up with that. And that's going to make them crazy. Um, and I just love the idea of bringing everything under one, you know, one roof, I, probably why you call your brand the umbrella, right? That makes sense exactly. to me now. Um but I'm curious, do you get people coming to you like really resistant to that? Like, oh, well, I want my teaching to be totally separate. And like maybe your, their artist name is, you know, some totally different like persona name than their personal name. Oh, absolutely. And I've <laughs> actually, I've actually, you know, that used to be such an interesting topic of debate when I was at the university setting, because my, especially my voice students they would come with their bios. We worked a lot on helping them create their bios. They would not mention anything other than their opera roles, right? Mm -hmm. So their bios were there. They were like, they sang in this opera role, this opera role, this opera role. And I would ask them, even at that moment, I'd say, what else do you bring to the table? Like, you know how many singer resumes I can put next to this one that have a ton of opera roles there? And it's like, what else do you bring? How else can I define you how else can we look at what your artistry is about what your philosophy is about what your values are what you stand for like let's start talking and they would say no 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 we have been requested by our the opera production department that we can only put mm. opera production you know opera roles in the bio we are not allowed to discuss anything else certainly not teaching I mean anything else we put is going to detract from the value of us being featured as a you know, in a lead role in such and such opera. So this was actually very much institutionalized, you know, in many ways, I've seen this come in and as part of the training, actually. So Which I, I, had, I guess I can understand, especially with an opera role, because you're trying to blend into a story and a character and all that versus, you know, when you're a performer and you say you're a vocalist, but you have your own style and recordings, then it is more about you and, and who you are as a person. Yeah, so so it was really interesting because those were the first conversations that I had with musicians where we were like really trying to look at things a little bit differently and trying to explore how can how can you find a, a different way to really still give it prior like give it its place in your resume, but but not limit yourself to only that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was the beginning of this process. And a lot of the people that come to me now are in that conundrum, right? They're trying to figure out how to unite all of the different things that they've been doing. And I've actually interviewed 
people who are like YouTubers, Zach Collins comes to mind. He's a great drum you know, percussionist. He's created one of the most uh, popular YouTube channels, but he actually started it with a different name. Mm. And he shared with us, you know, his journey. And like, I actually started it with a different name because I wasn't sure if it was going to be successful. And now yeah. it became so successful that now it's still with that different name. Oh, man. You know? But he just because, again, there's this fear, right? Sometimes that we don't know if things are going to work out. And he ended up becoming widely successful with this different YouTube channel and a different name. And so that, you know, that's just very interesting to kind of share with our the people we coach, because look like you, you could, yes, you could fail, but you could also succeed. And, and you want to give yourself a chance. It's kind of with that thing we were talking about before. You want to give yourself a chance, go all in. And so I encourage musicians to actually put a brand together with all of their things, you know, and they ask me, you know, when I go to your website, you know, we see your side as an, as a, as a you know, entrepreneur, you, your side as an educator, your side as a, you know, as a pianist, uh, your side as a speaker, you know, I'm, you know, I'm writing a book now. So I believe in uniting it all because people ultimately will come to you because of that combination of superpowers versus just one thing. Oh, I think that's very true. And I mean, I certainly do the same thing in my bio, you know, it starts out with, you know, musician, recording artist, best-selling author, speaker, right? It's all together in one. And I think musicians, they have a lot of things that they do that they maybe are discounting or like wanting to have, I, I get the same thing too. I like wanting to have separate bios as to maybe they think that's going to confuse people or overwhelm people. But I think it really does paint you as like a really big asset. Like, and I love what you said about like, they're all their superpowers in one place. Yeah. And you know, one of the hardest things that musicians struggle with is differentiation, right? They're taught to actually blend in and mm -hmm. fit in, right? The standards, like you prepare for juries, you have to do certain things. And certain, oh, yes, juries. You know what I mean? Certain <laughs> yes. criteria, and you have to fit in the standard and get graded according to what you're doing and how you, well you are fitting in and kind of, so it's very much ingrained in the training, once again, of how musicians are thought to believe. When you audition, you, you have to make sure you play your, your, you know, your excerpt, whatever it is, the same, like everyone else is doing the same thing. You have to try and do it the best way. And, but everyone is kind of like standardized in a certain mm -hmm. way. And so when you start looking at yourself through the musician's profit umbrella lens, you're like, okay, I can actually set myself apart, not just by trying to be the best performer I can be right. And trying to play better than everyone else, but to bring a different narrative to my artistry, to bring a different presence to what I represent, to infuse my story, my values, my belief systems, so that people come to me and they see the whole person, not just an amazing pianist or an amazing trumpet player or an amazing composer. They get to see everything. And we all know that stories are what helps people connect so a big part of, of this is, is really bringing in our legacy, our story, our, our you know, tradition, our upbringing, our roots, everything we can into the brand. Oh, I absolutely ab agree with that. And yeah, it's such a bummer that they're learning it that way at the university, because really with the landscape we're in, they are going to need to be online <laughs> and blending in is like the worst thing you can do. <laughs> in order to, you know, really draw your perfect audience to you, blending in is not going to work at all. Yeah. And I don't think it's, um, I, I just think it's the result of certain things that have been, you know, through history is, you know, kind of institutionalized with the rise of institutions, right. And the advent of like, you know, now, getting musicians to come in and go through a curriculum and be able to meet certain criteria in order to pass to the next level. I think there's certainly a place for that type of benchmark setting, right? I'm actually an examiner for the Royal Conservatory of Music. I went through their uh, training to help, uh, you know, evaluate the performance, uh, you know, of, of musicians throughout the country. And I traveled to Canada and I did the trainings with them there. And I've been traveling throughout the country, examining musicians and helping them understand where their progress is and how they can look forward to the next level. So I certainly think there is a, a, a time and a place for kind of meeting certain standards and, and being able to get yourself 
you know, from one learning phase to the next learning phase. And I, I think that's a great thing. But when it comes to building your now your livelihood and your career and transferring now from just musical development to business development, we need to start evolving that mentality a little bit and being more willing to look at what sets us apart rather than how we can just fit in. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And you, you do at, when you're at the university, you do have to learn like certain things in certain ways and, and be proficient and all of that. It's true. And I went somewhere that didn't have any kind of business training whatsoever. It was more like a conservatory style. So, you know, I came out this amazing musician, but I had no idea what to do with it, you know? So I really resonate with, with what you're talking about. So we talked about, you know, being an entrepreneur, getting out there, starting your business. I wanted to, to get into bringing in help because I also find there's a lot of resistance to this, mostly because they say, well, I'm not making enough money in order to pay somebody to help me. And so it becomes this vicious cycle where they can never get ahead because they're only one person. They can only do so much. And, you know, I try to say, well, just think about it. Like if you had this extra time, you could maybe do two more gigs a month and you could, you could pay for it. Or, you know, you would do a lot more things that you couldn't do because you're just one person, but like they have this fear of bringing someone on because it's costing them money. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Oh my goodness. That was one of my favorite topics. I'm so glad (laughs) you asked about that because again, I went through that too. You know, I started a business with my husband. We did all the jobs. We taught piano. We did marketing. We recruited the clients. We did the bookkeeping. We cleaned the academy. Like we did it all. I get it. Right. That's how most entrepreneurs start. Uh, But, you know, we had to go through the process of learning how to create the right systems, learning how to find the right support, learning how to delegate. I remember the first week we opened our academy, our business advisors were telling us, you need to have an assistant. And I actually had two, one that came Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the other one came Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they took turns, right? Mm -hmm. I remember walking them through the academy and trying to be like the CEO or whatever. And I literally confessed to them. I said, I have no idea what to tell you to do. Like, (laughs) I really don't know how you're going to help me. I know you need to help me. I don't know what to tell you to do because it was just not a chip that I had developed. <laughs> right. So I think part of the reasons why most solopreneurs initially resist the idea of bringing in people in addition to the financial concern, of course, it's not knowing how to set up their job and yeah, how yeah. to measure progress and how to create an actionable plan for growth and scalability. They just don't know. So they don't want to deal with it and they just prefer not to do it and just do it on their own, right? And keep doing it themselves. But the process of delegation and scaling your business needs to start actually way before you think about teams. It needs to start in your actual program and service delivery and how do you serve your clients? And this is one of the things that, you know, I have a client who you know, was teaching cello. She joined the, my, our program. And then within a matter of months, she launched a group program. And then she was able to scale and cross the six figure mark. And now she's working on building her teams. And every step of the way, what I'm telling her is how can you remove yourself? How can mm. you remove yourself? And at some point she confessed to me, she's like, you're always asking me to remove myself first. You wanted me to group my students, uh, you know, and figure out a way to, to deliver value without having it to be just one-on-one. Now you want me to remove your, myself from the marketing and the, and the prospecting and the recruiting. Every time you're telling me to remove myself, how, how much am I supposed to remove myself? And I think it's a very important mindset because I believe the more you want your organization to grow, the more you need to become a strategic thinker. Mm -hmm. not a doer, not a producer, right? You need to become like the person who's in the chess game, trying to look at the different pieces of the puzzle and what needs to take place. No one will do that for you. You need to be the mastermind strategic thinker. And if you're caught up all day, either teaching all day or running the business all day, no one will do that. And you'll always stay at that same level. So my philosophy and what I like to encourage musicians to look at in terms of support and delegation and team building and systems building is starting with their actual program, then moving into the administrative part uh, and growing from there. But always remember, the more you can have space to think, the more your business will grow. Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and, and for me, like, you know, having that hour to go on my walk every day and kind of have my thinking time is 
is major. Like I come up with some major ideas in my business that I never would be able to do that otherwise if I was just do, do, doing, right? And then there's also the fact that, you know, you do need to be kind of the public face of your business. You can have a lot of people helping you with marketing, but, you know, no one can come on this podcast and be talking in place of you. I mean, maybe eventually, but like right now you are kind of, you know, the figurehead in the face, right? And you need to have time to be able to come and and go on podcasts or do interviews or, you know, do trainings and and speak places and things like that. And you can't do that if you're in the teaching piano all the time. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right, which is why I'm so happy that you've created these types of platforms with a podcast and all the things you do, because that is one of the most profit producing activities that as you know, as CEO musicians, we can embrace is helping get ourselves out there, become visible anytime behind the microphone, whether you're on a podcast, whether you're doing a Facebook live, whether you're doing an Instagram live, anytime you're behind a microphone, you need to see it as one of the most profit producing activities you can be doing. And when we're talking about profit producing activities, it's a whole important part of this conversation, because when you start realizing that the amount of money you're wasting by doing things, for example, improving your website or developing this funnel or doing all these things that you may be tempted to do. And you actually may be good at it. Like I have a client who joined our program and she was just so good at making Canva graphics. And she kept putting <laughs> together this Canva and that Canva and all these beautiful graphics. And she was very excited. And I actually had to ask her to stop <laughs> very lovingly. I had to say, listen, this is like, you're going to find this as a weird advice, but I need you to stop making these beautiful Canva graphics and start focusing on really like designing your offer and putting it out there and getting yourself, you know, more in a strat- in a strategy mindset versus doing all of these Canva graphics. Well, that brings up such a great point because if if you're like that, if you find something that you're really good at that's in the weeds like that, where you're making Canva graphics and you're like, I feel so great making these, these look awesome. It's so fun. Well, one reason you might continue to make them is because it allows you to avoid the things that are scary and uncomfortable that you were telling her to do, right? Oh, I love that so much. (laughs) You're absolutely right. And I have to confess, I am that way too. You know, I've actually told myself, and, and that's something I'm always trying to check in is like, you know, what are the things that I'm doing that I know, even though I enjoy I probably shouldn't because there's other more scarier things that I need to be doing. And I'm just avoiding. Honestly, so I think we're all hundred percent, right? Mm-hmm. We have this, these comfort zone things that make us feel really accomplished and, and <laughs> safe yeah. and comfortable in doing them. And it's like, but I'm being productive. I'm working yeah. for my business. <laughs> and it just allows us to kind of push those things in the background that we might really feel uncomfortable doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Which is why when you have no choice, but to delegate, meaning when you have someone who's on payroll, right. Who's mm-hmm. waiting for the task, who's waiting for you to tell them what to do. Even if you don't know what to tell them to do, if you're like me, when I started saying, I don't know what to tell you to do. It's going to force you to start developing that CEO muscle in your brain because someone is waiting versus when you don't have someone, eh, you can be more lenient and you're just like, oh, I'll just keep doing it. I'll keep, you know, testing around. So my recommendation every single time, as soon as we start working with musicians is start with an assistant, get yourself mm. someone who can help, you know, take things off your plate. Do not feel tempted to just do it all on their own. Uh, And I have some conversations even before I start working with clients to really make sure they're okay with that. You know, it's like, you know, this is going to be the journey, but I'm going to be honest, like there's going to be parts of this that you're going to learn, but you're not going to want to do. And you're going to need to be quickly willing to let this go and have someone take it on because it is important, but it's not what you should be doing. Right. And so they, they, they kind of know that already kind of going in that their likeliest chances of success are going to be based on their willingness to get support. Right. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good that you're, you're giving that them that heads up. It's like, this is coming and you're going to need to do it. And it might not be easy and might be uncomfortable. And this kind of brings me to like the last question I want to cover while we've covered such amazing things, something that's come up. I know for me, as I've worked with people and as I've up leveled myself and, you know, I've wanted to say to people like, Hey, I want you guys to be the CEO of your business. And like, that was kind of like my goal. But what I've learned is that a lot of times the people that are coming to me are not at the level where that even resonates with them, where they're just like, 
CEO. Like I'm just a musician. I, I, I that, that makes no sense to me. I can't even see myself in that role. So I was just curious, like, are do you find that? And how do you kind of help them to transition in mindset to like, oh, I can be a CEO? That is such a great question, Brie. And you're absolutely right. The word CEO is very foreign in the music world, right? And so the way I like to frame it is what are their desires? What do they really want? Usually in many cases, in most cases, it's to win back their time, to be able to take care of themselves. So I try to connect first from the places that I know we are in harmony, like we are together from the you know consonant chord of like, let's get you to understand that you want to win back your time. You don't want to have to be hustling your way through this career. You don't want to be burning yourself out. You want to be able to make more money, right? When they feel that empathy, when they sense that the person that they're talking to, you know, gets them and understands what they really want, then I find that they're more and more willing to, to consider other ways of seeing and doing things mm. because they, they get that foundation of like, yes, you get me, you know, versus sometimes if, if, if I rush too much into trying to present the new opportunity, the new vision of what they need to become without really acknowledging and making them aware that I get it. Of course I get it. I'm a musician too. I'd like to be just practicing piano all day long and not have to worry about anything. Of course, that's why I, I, I became who I became and all of my degrees are in piano and I get it. <laughs> so I think there needs to be at the beginning, whenever we're trying, and this is a very core, even marketing principle, when we're talking with our potential clients, when we're talking with people on our team, we always have to find the common denominator first and find a way to really connect, to understand that we're safe. You know, someone is there to hold space for us. And when we trust the other person, then we're more willing to be led and to, to be guided into new perspectives. Uh, and so this is something that I've really focused on. And when I, whenever I rush that process, that's when I recognize the resistance, right? And so that's kind of how I've, how I've managed to connect. In fact, there's a term by Dan Siegel, he's a parenting coach who, you know, I have a seven-year-old and a two-year-old, so I read a lot of parenting books. He calls it connect and redirect. Mm. It's actually a, a thing, right? When you want to help people embrace a new perspective, a new vision, and understand things that are foreign to them, the first step is to connect, and then you redirect. When my son is sitting there saying, I don't want to go to bed, and this and that, whenever I try to say, no, but you have to go to bed, like, he won't do it. I need to sit in there and be like, okay, I know, you know, you're playing this. It's very fun, and I know you would like to stay. I get it, but let's like, we need to, we need to go to bed. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I practice this daily in multiple areas of my life, uh, not just in my business, you know? No, that's really good. And I love that parenting example. As I said, like, as I work with people and then further down the road, I introduce this idea and they're like, okay, you know, maybe this doesn't seem so crazy and foreign, but yeah, like I'm not going to put become the CEO of your music business on a sales page because people are going to be like, Oh, that's not for me. Like I'm like, that's way down the road, you know? So I love that. Absolutely. You got to bring people slowly into this idea and allow them to trust you. Like yeah. you have their best interests in mind. So that, I love that perspective. Well, yeah. this has been such a great conversation. I would love for you to tell our listeners how they can find out more about you, your website and your socials. Absolutely. So you can visit my website. You probably want to read it here on the show notes because my name is a little difficult to spell sometimes. So it's fabianaclore.com. I have everything there on my website. You're also linked to my social media channels. I have Instagram uh, at fabiana.clore and my Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, all the good things. I also have a Facebook group called Musicians Creating Prosperity. So you're welcome to follow me online. Feel free to connect with me. I would love to be able to, you know, have any conversation and connect with anyone who would be interested. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Fabiana. This has been such a great conversation. I love it when we can have more of like a, a give and take kind of conversations about things that I'm really passionate about. A lot of times on the show, I'm learning about new things or trying to expose musicians to new 
apps and, and things like that. And so conversations like this really light me up. So I appreciated you coming on and, and being able to talk about entrepreneurship and musicians. Thank you, Brie. It's been wonderful having this conversation. And I hope that it inspires all of your listeners to go ahead and jump off the cliff, right? And just take action and go for what they want and not feel that they need to feel safe before they do things, but to just listen to their intuition and love themselves enough to give themselves a chance. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.